to session two of Lead You. Excited to be here with you tonight. As you can see from the screen, we're talking tonight about what's called the drama of doctrine, living in God's story. And so we want to spend a little bit of time tonight talking about this idea of God's story and what that means for us in our lives and how we live our lives in accordance with what God's called us to. And so uh, we're going to look at that in a few different ways, but um, perhaps you've been in a context of a college or a seminary in which you found yourself looking at different Bible classes that were offered. Uh, I remember when I went to seminary, um, there were all sorts of different requirements, and in those requirements, we had New Testament survey one and two, and Old Testament survey one and two. When I was at College of the Ozarks, we took a class called Biblical Survey, and you can find books that abound on introduction to Biblical Survey or Old Testament and New Testament survey, and in these survey courses, what oftentimes happens is you'll learn about these particular books of the Bible. They'll tell you the authors of those books, they'll tell you uh, the historical situation, they'll give you a little bit of the content and the themes of what's happening in those books. But a lot of times it's really difficult when you leave that course or finish reading that book to understand what does that mean for me for application? Uh, how am I supposed to live my life differently in light of this particular book? I mean, just think about some of the Old Testament books that you probably spend a lot of time reading, like Obadiah. All right, you guys all spend regular um, Bible study time in Obadiah. Uh, but, but something like that in which we begin to recognize that we can talk about the historical situation. We can talk about the authorship of the book. We can say something to the fact that, okay, Obadiah teaches us that the judgment that's coming against Edom is representative of the judgment that's coming on all nations. And then you go, and so I changed my life. How? And it can be kind of difficult for us to move to application. Sometimes I think the difficulty um, may be that we just don't really understand it. We haven't been trained to understand that. But sometimes I'm afraid that perhaps the difficulty is that we find the task difficult. We find putting it into practice difficult. We have to do the hard work of understanding the text and then putting it into practice and living it out. And so I think that sometimes when we talk about this idea of living it out, of putting it into practice, of seeing God's word and figuring out what that means for our particular life and how that's significant for our life, we find that we're so far removed from the experience, particularly of the Old Testament, but really if you think about the historical context, we're so far removed from the first century context in the New Testament that we're not really sure what we're supposed to do about it. And so what we're going to talk about tonight will hopefully help us understand a framework for what we're going to do with God's Word. And then next week in session three, we'll actually then talk about how to read God's Word, and it will kind of be in conjunction with what we're talking about tonight. Well, one of the challenges, I think, with the Old Testament is that it's just so long ago. It's talking about a society and a culture that we're not really familiar with. But I find it really important for us that when we get to the New Testament, that the New Testament authors spend a great deal of time talking about the Old Testament. Now think about this for a minute. You've got these New Testament authors who are apostles, and by virtue of their apostleship would have authority to tell us how to live and tell us what to do. They were followers of Jesus and oftentimes record Jesus' very words. In fact, we have the Gospels in which we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John writing down for us the life and ministry and words of Jesus. And so they carry an authority based on the fact that they are apostles or that they're recording the words of Jesus. And then we have the fact that the Holy Spirit comes upon these people on the day of Pentecost and we see the birth of the church and the work of the Holy Spirit in their lives. And so we could begin to recognize that they had the authority to speak truth, truth that we could then learn from and apply to our lives, but they routinely go back to the Old Testament. And the question for us is why did they find it necessary and helpful and purposefully point us back to the Old Testament stories? And I think there's a lot of different reasons for this. But among those many purposes for such a move is to remind us that we are a part of an older, longer, and larger story than our own. It puts us in the context of a bigger story, a larger one and an older one. And so when we get to the New Testament and we open those scriptures and we see that they're bringing us back to the Old Testament, this is not just an add-on to our Bibles. 
It's not just an optional part, but we find that the whole of Scripture is God's Word teaching us how to live in God's story, and that story is God's story that goes back longer, and it's larger, and it's older than we could ever imagine, and it has weight for what we do today. Paul teaches us this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, so if you have a Bible and you want to turn there with me, let's take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. If you don't, I have it on the screen here for you. But Paul does this very thing in which he's teaching this largely Gentile Corinthian church about the fact that they're actually a part of Israel's story in the Old Testament. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. For I want you to know, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Notice what Paul's done here. In writing to a Gentile audience, he's made a really important statement here. Our fathers. He's talking to a Gentile church, and he tells them, our fathers in the wilderness. He's made them a part of Israel's story. He said Israel's story didn't stop with the gospel. Israel's story didn't stop when we ended the Old Testament and began the New Testament. Israel's story is continuing right now. In fact, in Galatians chapter 6, he goes on to call them the Israel of God. And he's talking about the fact that we have this bigger picture, this larger story, and the Corinthian church is not on their own in the midst of kind of how do we live Corinthian-like, but he's saying how do we live in God's story, and we have some precedent set before us. He does the same thing in Galatians chapters 3 and 4, and if you want to turn there with me, we find that he's going to make some similar comments with the story of Abraham. Again, I have it on the screen for you. He begins in verse 7, Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. And if you skip down to verse 26, after Paul's been talking about the law for a bit, he says, For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. And so we find here in Galatians chapter 3 and 4 some really significant things that Paul is telling us. First of all, we see that he's put them in the context of Israel's story by bringing it back to Abraham. He says that you're not children of Abraham by circumcision, you're not children of Abraham by lineage, you're children of Abraham by faith, by faith in God's promise, which is fulfilled in the Messiah, Christ Jesus. And so he lays that out for us. And he goes on, in fact, and he says, not only are you a part of this story, you're a part of a new family. And this new family that you're a part of is by virtue of adoption as sons. And notice the Trinitarian language here, that we have God the Father has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And so we have the Father and the Spirit and the Son at work, bringing us into right relationship with him. And this is what we talked about in session one. And so we have this idea here, that the gospel, which Paul's talking about in Galatians, really the entire book of Galatians, because he's told them that they've bought in to a false gospel, but particularly in chapters 3 and 4, Paul's telling him that we have this picture of the gospel, that yes, it includes justification by faith. You see that in chapter 3. 
Yes, it means that Jesus has saved us from our sins, but it means something bigger and more than that in this context. It means that we are now children of God, that we participate in who God is. And we can see that. The gospel is bigger than these statements because the New Testament authors place the entirety of Jesus' life. Right? Not just Jesus died for my sins, but the entirety of Jesus' life is significant. His birth, life, death, resurrection, ascension, and the continued work at the right hand of the Father. And all of this as the resolution of the story of Israel and the whole world. Right? So Jesus' story, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension to the right hand of God, the entire story of Jesus is seen as the resolution of of the story of the whole world. The problem that the world faces is corrected through Jesus. And for our lives, we're then brought into right relationship with God. You can see this further. And in the life of Jesus, God's promises to Abraham, promises of a land, a people, a name, that he would be a blessing to the nations, are fulfilled in the faithful Israelite, who of course is Jesus, right? Jesus, the faithful Israelite. That is why those who are in Christ are part of this bigger story. When we find ourselves in Christ, we find ourselves a part of this bigger story because Jesus himself is the faithful Israelite. And so Israel's story that comes to a resolution in Jesus for those who are in Jesus see their lives being resolved into and brought into harmony with God's story. And so that is why those who are in Christ are part of this bigger story for they participate in the life of the faithful Israelite while at the same time participating in the life of the triune God. And if you think back to session one, that's what we spent a good deal of time talking about, was the fact that salvation and the gospel was a story that tells us that we were created for relationship with the triune God, and that we have been redeemed for the purpose of returning back into that relationship with the triune God. And that's what we see happening here when we begin to talk about these stories. And I think when we begin to view the gospel this way, and scripture this way, we find that Israel's story in the Old Testament takes on some added significance for us. It's not just something that we're supposed to read because it's in our Bible. It's not something that we're really confused about why it's there, but we begin to recognize that Israel's story becomes our story, that our lives are wrapped up in this story of Israel, and it takes on that added significance. And so what we want to explore in session two here when we talk about the drama of doctrine and living in God's story is that this understanding of our participation in the bigger story ought to impact our day-to-day lives as followers of Jesus. When we talk about discipleship, there are a lot of different ways to define it, and we talked about a couple of those. But when we define discipleship very simply as following Jesus, then we see that understanding our participation in this bigger story Understanding our participation in Jesus' story as the resolution of Israel's story, that should impact our day-to-day lives as followers of Jesus. And so if you're like, what does the Old Testament have to do with my day-to-day discipleship? The answer is everything. And if you ask, what does the New Testament have to do with my day-to-day discipleship? You say, everything. Because God's word is the way of communicating with us the way that we are to live within his bigger, grander, larger, and older story. And if you think at session one, I made a quote from uh, Russell Moore. I said that if, if our story is that we've accepted Jesus into our lives, that's not wrong. It's just not the way the Bible typically talks about it. It's not accepting Jesus into our lives, but rather God inviting us into his life. And when we view the story of Scripture as the overarching theme for our own lives, I think we begin to get the right focus once again. When we begin from God's story and my participation in it, that helps us not to be my story and I'll let God in to this little part of it. And so I hope that this is just an extension of what we talked about last week. So I've mentioned a few times we're talking about God's story and the Bible's story, but sometimes when we hear story, we think fictional, made up, untrue, which is really disappointing. Uh, My career, if you will, is to be a Christian worldview teacher, but I get the pleasure of teaching literature, which was actually my college major. I love literature. I love reading. I love reading stories. It always makes me sad when people think that story equals untrue, because that's untrue, right? Right? 
Stories carry truth. Stories are true in what they're trying to convey and what they're trying to do. Now, the Bible story happens to be historically true. Jesus of Nazareth really did die and rise again on the third day and leave the tomb empty. And we can talk about all the historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. So it's historically reliable and true, but that doesn't deny the fact that it has story-like qualities. And we can see this very easily in the way in which we look at the beginning and the end of the Bible, can't we? The story of the Bible begins in a garden. And the story of the Bible ends in Revelation chapter 21 and 22 in a garden. We have this picture of this this circle, this movement of God in which he's dwelling with his people, his creation in his own image, again, creating them for participation and relationship with him, and he dwells with them in a garden. But we know the story of sin. We see that they get kicked out. We know the brokenness in the world that ensues, but God all along is working about redemption to bring them back to a garden. In fact, it's a garden that looks very similar with a river and the tree of life. Although there's two trees of life. But the tree of life in the garden. And really what we find is that at the beginning and the end, this story like quality, it's a story of God's presence with his people. We can take a look at that in a few different places. But think about the fact that we have this uh, garden in which God is dwelling with his people. But then we have the tabernacle of God again dwelling with his people. And when they get into the land and they get into Jerusalem and they build the temple during the reign of Solomon, God fills the temple with his glory. And he dwells once again with his people in the temple. And when we see that the temple is destroyed and the glory of the Lord has left it, and we have this entire period of silence in which we're wondering what God is doing to resolve this story. He's promised his king to come. And all of the promises that come with it, they were going to be a blessing to the nations. There would be a great land, a great people, a great name. What has happened? God's king is not on his throne until he arrives in Jesus. In God, the word became flesh. John chapter 1 verse 14 tells us the word became flesh and dwelt among us. In fact, he tabernacled among us. And so God's presence is now once again with his people in Emmanuel, which means God with us. And when Jesus ascends, he says that he will send the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, to come. And the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost uh, breathes life in these people and they come and they respond to the gospel and it's the institution of the church. And we find that in the church, God's people are God's presence on earth through the work of the Holy Spirit until the time when God brings all things back into right relationship with him in which God brings the new Jerusalem out of heaven to earth. We see the garden imagery in Revelation 22, and it says in Revelation 21 that the dwelling place of God is with man. And so God once again is with his people in the garden, in the place that he has created and set aside for them. And it's a beautiful picture of this movement in which God has brought about salvation and redemption by bringing his presence to his people. And so you can see here on the screen some some statements that hopefully help us recognize what's going on. That when we begin from a Trinitarian perspective, rather than a man-centered perspective, I think it helps us realize that salvation is about bringing us back into this right relationship with the triune God who created us and redeemed us for that relationship. And so this story of the Bible tells us from garden to garden, the picture of redemption. And so the Bible and its story-like qualities, I think, helps us enter in in a way that a mere propositional list of facts doesn't do for us. But I think the Bible is more than just a story. It's more than just a story that we passively listen to. It's more than just a story even that we read, though we need to be reading it. It's, in fact, a drama that is enacted. You can see uh, up on the screen or in your participant's guide uh, a chart that's reproduced in a, a book called The Drama of Scripture by Goheen and Bartholomew. And I recommend that book to you at the end of the Participant's Guide. There's a shorter and easier version called The True Story of the Whole World, but both of them are good. But notice that they have uh, told the story of the Bible in terms of a drama, in fact, a six-act play. 
And you can look at the different acts there in terms of God establishing his kingdom and creation. And then we see the problem that comes in which um, the, the kingdom, the fall, the, the brokenness of it. And yet I think we have some hope initiated there in Genesis chapter 3 where God already establishes that he will defeat the serpent. But then in Act 3, we see the story of Israel in the Old Testament, in which we look at the kingdom and the kings who come, and we see the, uh, the hope that comes through King David. And we see a people for his king in which God has um, established his covenant with Abraham and his covenant with Moses, and then his covenant with David, in which he continues to reaffirm that his promises are true and he will not abandon those. And he's given a land to his people in the book of Joshua. He brings them into the land that he had promised to Abraham, to the land of Canaan. And while they're in the land, it's when he establishes later on this kingship with David and Solomon. And so we have this hope that God will bring about his promises, will bring about this redemption, that once again his people can dwell with him in the land that he has prepared for them. But we know from the story of the Old Testament that God's people were disobedient that they weren't fulfilling their role as a kingdom of priests, to be his representative to the nations. Instead, they became like the nations. And God consistently sent the prophets to call them back to repentance. But they rejected them. They cast them away. And they continued in their wicked ways. So God sent them into exile. And even after bringing them back from exile and rebuilding the temple, we find that it's not like it was in the days of Solomon. Something is missing, and pretty clearly we never see the temple filled with the glory of God in the way that we do in the reign of Solomon. And so something is missing, and we have this period of silence for 400 years in which God's people are wondering, has God abandoned us? Has God forsaken his promises to Israel? What in the world is going on? And we see the conflict in the drama. What's going on? There was this sin, this brokenness, this disunity with God, and God promised that he'd bring it back into right relationship, but we don't see it. So for 400 years, there's this interlude, there's this period of silence, but in Act 4, Goheen and Bartholomew tell us about the fact that the king has come, the coming of the king, Jesus, the promised Messiah, the king, the anointed one, he's come, his name is Jesus, He is the son of God, and he is here, and we have hope once again. Redemption, in fact, is accomplished through the cross and the resurrection of Jesus. And so as we move into Act 5 and Jesus ascends, we now know that there is work to do. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, kind of gives a program for the entire book of Acts. And it says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Well, in the book of Acts, we find that they get to Jerusalem and they get to Judea. And they get to Samaria, and they begin to spread out across the earth. But here's what's really fascinating about this. All through Act 5, Scene 2, we've been watching this drama unfold. As we open God's Word and we look at His story and we see the drama of history, we see this drama in Scripture, we've been watching it unfold and it's been this story that's been on stage and we're like, wow, this is a great story. I wonder how it's going to be resolved. And all of a sudden in Act 5, Scene 2, we find ourselves transported from the audience to the stage. We're part of the drama. We're not just passively sitting by watching this happen. In fact, God tells us that we have now become participants in his drama of redemption. We are supposed to be witnesses to the ends of the earth. And we've been thrust onto the stage and we've been given a script. The script that came before us. And it says, how are you going to live this out? And in Acts 6, we already have the promise of how it's going to work out. It's not out of our own power. It's not out of our own awesomeness. But rather, God himself will accomplish it through the return of the king. Not the Lord of the Rings book, though that's fantastic. But the return of the true king, Jesus Christ. And redemption will be completed. It's a beautiful picture, and this drama helps us to understand that this is being lived out by God's people, both faithful and unfaithful, 
from the beginning of time, but we have been moved from the audience to the stage and we've become participants in this drama. I think the drama idea helps us so much more than just a story because a story can be read passively and not change us. But a drama in which we are thrust onto the stage means we have to act. We can run and hide off in the corner or we can just kind of ad lib and do whatever we want or we can do what God has called us to do on that stage. That's why I love an illustration that N.T. Wright gives about a lost Shakespeare play. As a British literature fan, Shakespeare is kind of one of my favorites, so this kind of appeals to me in that way. But imagine, you know, you've probably read more Shakespeare plays than you ever cared to or seen them enacted, but imagine that there's another one out there, one that's not yet been discovered. And this Shakespeare play gets discovered, and at the beginning it tells us that it's an act, or it's a, it's a play or a drama in five acts. But as we begin to flip through it, excited that we can now perform this new Shakespeare play, we get to the end of Act 4, and there's nothing there. He's told us it's a drama in five acts, but we only have four acts. And so they call together all the best Shakespeare actors in the world, and they say, we want to put on this play, it's fantastic, we just don't have Act 5. And they're like, no problem, right? Because there's something about these professional Shakespeare actors that they understand. They're familiar with Shakespeare as an author. They know how he writes. They know the kinds of things that he directs his actors to say. Well, that's helpful. They've actually practiced Shakespeare. They've performed him over and over and over again for a living. So they've been practiced in acting out Shakespeare's plays, his directions, what he's told them to do, where to move, where to stand, what to say, how to feel, when to cry, when to laugh, when to dress up weird. So he's done all of these things and they've followed these instructions, these directions over and over again to where they can begin to anticipate what he would tell them to do. But they've been students of Shakespeare as well. They've diligently studied the part of the script that they have. They've studied the scripts they had before and they've memorized them, and now they sit down and they diligently study the four acts that they have in this lost play. And they begin to read them and memorize them to the point where they then act faithfully in the scene for which they don't have a script. They know there's five acts, they don't have act five, but because they know Shakespeare, because they've practiced what he's told them to do in the past, because they have four acts, they can anticipate what he would tell them to do in act five. And so they can act to the best of their ability with respect to what they know about the script and the script writer. They know four acts. They know the characters. They know how the characters have been acting. They know script writer. They know Shakespeare. They know his tendency for things, you know, to go poorly in the end. And so they know what to expect. And so they can write and faithfully act Act 5, even though they don't have a direct script. Well, I think you can begin to see what happens when we view Scripture as a drama in the same way. As Christians, we are actors in God's drama. And as actors in God's drama, we should be familiar with the triune God who is the author of the doctrine or the drama of redemption, right? We should be familiar with the author. And the author of this drama is God himself. So we must know God. That's what we talked about in session one. We need to know the God who we claim to worship. And then we need to be practiced in acting out God's directions, his commands. What has he told us to do in this drama? We know certain things about what that looks like. And so we have those parts of scripture and we can learn to work that out. And as we practice those out, we can begin to anticipate what he calls us to do. We need to diligently study the part of the script that we do have the acts of scripture that we do have. We need to diligently study them so we can act faithfully the part of scripture, right? The, the part of the drama, I should say, that act five, scene two, in which we are thrust onto the stage and we don't have a word-for-word script. I don't know about you, I didn't wake up this morning with some paper by my bedside where God said, all right, do this, say this, go here, do that. We don't get that kind of a script. 
But we do have the script that goes before us. We have God's word, this drama of redemption that teaches us how to live faithfully. And the more that we diligently study it, the more that we understand it, the more that we understand the author who is directing us through that, the better that we can learn how to live that out without the word for word, moment by moment script that maybe sometimes we're asking God for. And so we can act to the best of our ability with respect to what we know about the script itself, what's come before, and the script writer, the triune God. And so I think it's helpful for us in picturing the fact that having been audience members and learning this script of watching this drama unfold, that we then get thrust onto the stage, but we're not left helpless. We didn't know that we had a part in this play, but we've been practicing, we've been watching, we've been studying diligently. And so when we're thrust onto the stage and it says, now it's your turn, we have a chance. Certainly we're going to do it imperfectly. Certainly we're not going to remember all the lines or all of the commands or we're going to stumble across it as we do it. But it's not like God has left us without any idea of what to do. But it requires work, requires us to study it diligently. But here's what's really great, unlike the Shakespeare play. We have in Act 6, we actually know the ending. And we know that God is victorious, that redemption is accomplished, that Jesus Christ is victorious. So there's a lot of hope and confidence when we're thrust onto the stage because we know that God is with us, that God is victorious, and that he will help us even when we stumble and fall and forget our lines and mess it up. Right. So we have Act 6 before us. We know the ending to the story. We know the beginning to the story. And we need to live faithfully in the story that God has called us into. I think this is why Richard Hayes, professor of New Testament at Duke University, says this with respect to that passage that we read earlier in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He says, One of our fundamental pastoral tasks is to teach our congregations to find themselves in the stories of Israel and the early church. Rather than seeking to make the text relevant, Paul seeks to draw his readers into the text in such a way that its world reshapes the norms and decisions of the community in the present. Here's what he's saying. He's saying we we spend a lot of time going, how do I take that thing that's irrelevant and make it relevant? But scripture is not irrelevant. It just requires work to put it into practice. And so he says the more that we read, the more that we study, the more that our pastors do that work of helping us in that process, the more that we do that as parents for our children, the more that we do that as a community of believers for our friends and brothers and sisters in the church, we encourage one another in this process, we begin to see how we can live that out. And we find ourselves in Israel's story. We find ourselves in the story of the early church. And because we don't need to make it relevant, Paul and other New Testament authors are just inviting us to learn from those stories, to learn from the story, to take direction from God's word, from God's drama about how we should live in the present. And it molds us and it shapes us. And the more that we do that, I think the better we get at it. The habits that we develop in our lives, some of them come pretty naturally and some of them require work. But if we practice, if we move ourselves in the direction of seeking out God's story and living that faithfully, I think we find that over time it becomes second nature to us. It becomes a part of who we are because we've been molded and shaped by God's story by God's direction, and not by the world's, not by our own story. But we follow God in what he's told us to do. And so to return to a quote that we looked at in session one from Kevin Van Hooser. Kevin Van Hooser, by the way, wrote a book called The Drama of Doctrine, which is where I stole the title for this session. So we'll give him some credit. But he says that theology exists to help the church creatively and faithfully to continue the way, the truth, and the life of Jesus Christ until he comes. Theology is God-centered biblical interpretation that issues in performance knowledge on the world stage to the glory of God. So simply stated, I think that our task is to understand the script of God's drama and to live it out faithfully on the world stage.
People are watching. Whether they meant to show up or not, to God's drama on stage, they're seeing us perform. And we declare to be followers of Jesus when we say, I am a Christian, and they watch our life, we are making a statement about the scriptwriter, the God that we worship. And so it should push us, it should thrust us, it should just make us sprint toward God's word to say, where are my lines? Where are my directions? I don't know how to do this. I'm a terrible actor. It's actually really true about me. I'm a terrible actor. So how am I supposed to live this out? You didn't even give me anything. Except practically everything. He didn't give you a word-for-word script this morning. But he gave you more than enough to know how to follow him, to trust him, to love him, and to display that on the world stage to a world that desperately needs God and is watching. But what are they seeing? And that's what I hope we see tonight is that the drama of doctrine, God's drama is so much more than just, hey, that's a neat way to look at the Bible. But it's a way that says, wow, there is something when I open God's word that transforms me and changes me and teaches me how to live. It invites me to participate in something bigger than myself. Don't we all like being a part of something bigger than ourselves? I mean, like the NBA finals are going on right now, and I don't really watch the NBA a whole lot anymore. I lived in Chicago during the Jordan years, and so basketball after that just doesn't seem real anymore. It's like a different sport. Okay, but that's going on, and I always make myself wonder this. What about that 15th guy on the end of the bench that never sees the court? Never sees the court. No one even knows his name. We know every celebrity in the world, but we don't know the 15th guy on the bench for the Cleveland Cavaliers. And if you do, you watch too much NBA. (laughs) But that guy is a part of something bigger than himself. And I should have used the Warriors because they're probably going to win, but they're... The end of the day, the championship team, that last guy on the bench who maybe doesn't play a single minute in the entire series is going to get a ring. And he's going to be victorious. And he probably put in a lot of time and effort and hours, and maybe they wouldn't have won if he hadn't worked really hard in practice. But nobody else outside the team really knows that. But he's a part of something bigger than himself. And so I think my answer to that question, when I go, why is that guy going through all that hard work to be on that team when he never even gets to play? And the reality is because he's a part of something bigger. God has called us into something infinitely bigger than ourselves. Our story might be like that 15th guy on the bench. It might be like the 15th guy on the bench of the JV basketball team. It might seem so insignificant by comparison but it's not insignificant because it's not about me. It's not about us. It's about God and his story. And he has a way of taking what seems insignificant to the world and making it really significant in his plan. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 says that God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. God takes the insignificant. God takes the lowly. And if it's just my life and I invite God into a little corner of it, it seems pretty insignificant. It seems pretty worthless. But if I allow God to use the messed up whatever I am, take the sort of good, the really bad, and everything in between, say, God, you called me to be a part of your story. I don't know how you're going to use me. I can't even act, but put me on stage and tell me what to do. He'll do it. He accomplishes unbelievable things in his drama of redemption through people who feel insignificant. Because it's not about my skills. It's not about my plan. It's not about my story. It's about God's story and how he wants to use me in that story.
I hope there's some application there for you. But here's what I want to challenge us with at the end. One of our problems that we looked at in session one is biblical illiteracy. We live in a culture that's biblically illiterate. And many in the Western church have found themselves going the way of culture and are biblically illiterate. illiterate. How are we supposed to live in God's story without a day-to-day, moment-by-moment script if he's given us the script and told us to diligently study it so we can live faithfully in the things that happen on a day-to-day basis, but we've never really opened the rest of the script? We just hop on stage and go, oh, I'll make it up as I go. So what I want to challenge us with tonight, do we know the script of God's drama well enough that we can faithfully live out our part on the world stage? Do we know God's script well enough that we can faithfully live out our part on the world stage? Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you that you have called us into something greater than ourselves. We thank you that you take what is weak and foolish and insignificant in the world and you use it to glorify yourself. You use it, you use us, broken and imperfect. Pray tonight as we continue in conversation with one another that we might recognize in a way maybe we've lost track of or never even really thought of that we're a part of your ongoing drama of redemption, that we have a part to play in that drama, that we don't just passively sit and watch. We thank you for that, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So about a five-minute break, and then break into groups and start talking about these questions. (laughs) Thank <laughs> you.